So our, our next panel is who and what will get to think the future? And I'm uh, delighted to be uh, talking about this with Ted Chang, uh, a science fiction writer, a technical writer, the author of Stories of Your Life and Others and the Life Cycle of Software Objects. His stories have been winners of the Locus and Nebula Awards. And he is distinguished today by being a science fiction writer who's not actually in the book. So he still has some, some, some shred of independence uh, <laughs> to, to, to tell us what he really thinks. So uh, Ted, I want to start by asking you, I want to lean on this word think. Uh, I'm really, this is a subject that I've become really interested in over the past year or so. I'm working on a book uh, about algorithms as culture machines, basically, uh, and the ways in which thinking might not be uh, the same anymore. So how do you, th what do you think thinking is going to mean, and do you see that changing in, in the near future? Well, okay, so there was this, uh, I thought a really fascinating anecdote that the science writer Stephen Johnson uh, mentioned once. Uh, he was working on on a science book, and he um, he has installed on his computer uh, a piece of software, which um, it uh, it caches all like sort of all the web pages and stuff that he has consulted for research, and all sorts of his notes. Uh, it, it organizes uh, uh, all the information that he wants to use. And this software also scans w what he is typing as he types. And then it throws up possibly relevant information from his personal research database. And in, in the course of uh, writing a chapter, it, the software threw up uh, a piece of information which he thought was, that was a really interesting uh, connection it made. Uh, you know, and then that gave rise to an entire chapter of his book making this, 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 this connection between what, you know, one thing that he had said and this other thing that the software had brought up. And he, uh, he wondered, who came up with the idea for that chapter? Was it him or was it the software? Um, now, you know, that, that example is, you know, that's not, that, that piece of software is not something that most of us are using right now. But um, I think, you know, the fact that, um, we are more and more uh, sort of uh, relying on computer devices uh, as uh, a lot, like a lot of people call them secondary brains. Um, uh, we are sort of doing a lot of uh, cognitive outsourcing. So in, um, in various fashions, uh, our thinking is uh, partially being done by algorithms now. And um, we, you know, uh, our creativity is not all happening within our heads now. Um, and uh, you know, at some point, uh, it, you know, it will probably become worthwhile asking, um, what, uh, you know, how, how, much, how much do we want to uh, how much of our cognition do we want to cede to uh, software? And will there be, um, uh, uh, will, will the companies who make that software have an interest in uh, getting a part of our cog cognition? Um, will different companies you know, uh, offer sort of maybe uh, different benefits or different styles of cognition? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, is that something that we will be? Uh, is that a choice that we will have to make in uh, in the so when we choose the software we use? I, I think we're already there. I mean, uh, this is I'm b borrowing this from from one of my colleagues at ASU. But you know, how many of you use Apple devices? How many of you feel that this is in some way kind of a moral or aesthetic choice? <laughs> right? That you sort of look down on people who don't use Apple devices, right? Uh, and the same could probably be said of many of the Android users in the room. Uh, we, and there, there, there's already a kind of uh, cognitive investment that we make. You know, at a certain point, you have years of your personal history living in somebody's cloud. Uh, and that goes beyond merely being a memory bank. It's also a cognitive bank in some way. Uh, I want to come back to, to another thing you mentioned, which is this notion of creativity. One of the, uh, we've always used tools uh, from the I Ching to uh, you know 
flipping through your copy of the Aeneid in the Middle Ages uh, to going to a library and looking at what books are on the shelf next to the thing you thought you were looking for. Uh, we've always used serendipity, a sort of structured serendipity to do research, to have, to do intellectual work. Uh, and one of the most interesting things about digital systems, like the one that uh, you were talking about from, from Stephen Johnson, is that they also manufacture serendipity in a way that is supposed to be helpful to you. Uh, but all of these systems have their implicit biases and, and reasons for doing things, right? And so we might be using Twitter as another serendipity engine to try and find out what's happening in the world. But Twitter isn't only interested in, in showing us stuff that's happening in the world, right? They have these other agendas. Other, the, as we were just talking about in the last panel, uh, people are trying to make money off this. Uh, and we're not really the users of a lot of these systems. We're the, we're the product. We're the, you know, the, 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 the thing that's being sold to, to advertisers. So uh, as you think about uh, where we're heading, do you, I'd like to hear you, you reflect a little more on that, that question of style. Do you think that, uh, do you want to speculate on, on what kinds of styles we might actually get to have? I mean, is it going, do, are we already, do we already have, are we already starting to wear the grooves uh, through the relationships we have now with our software tools? Um, well, okay, so in terms of, you know, the, what sort of serendipity we rely on, I think that, um, uh, I think Google Autocomplete is, um, uh, you know, uh, I think it has, has become something that a lot of people rely on. You type in a word, and then you see what's in the drop-down list, and that will often influence what, it, what the next word you type is. Um, and while, uh, you know, it would be nice to think that, you know, that drop-down list is uh, determined on purely objective terms, you know, uh, we have we have no guarantee that that is. I mean, there is no there is no real de definition of what constitutes an objective, you know, population of that drop down list. There's going to be an algorithm, and different people, you know, will offer different algorithms for how to populate that uh, that autocomplete list, and um, that will shape the serendipity that uh, you experience when you are doing research. Um, even something like uh, th this is this next example is is not so much algorithmic, but again the fact that you know so many people rely on Wikipedia, and you know uh, whatever the authors of that Wikipedia entry and whatever links they put in, um, those are probably shaping a lot of people's ways of thinking about topics. Um, and you know these are all things that uh, you know we you know uh, you know we didn't voluntarily sign up for, and initially you know we think these are incredibly welcome conveniences, but you know they are uh, they are shaping uh, uh, yeah the serendipity that we experience there. Uh, um, they are in some way influencing our creativity, and. Um, you know, at, at the moment, Google, I think, you know, really dominates uh, search, at least in the English language. Um, but, you know, I mean, you could, you could easily imagine a situation where different search engines, you know, uh, are, you know, major players. And if they, if their autocomplete lists are, you know, you know different in some way, uh, you know, people might, you know, uh, choose their search engine because, you know, I, I sort of like the autocomplete suggestions that Bing is offering more than the ones that Google is offering. They just get me. You right. know, yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, so that is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's sort of an extension of targeted advertising. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, it's an opportunity for a kind of, you know, uh, targeted, uh, you know, cognitive bias. I, 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 I I'm fascinated by autocomplete uh, as a short digression. I, 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 I teach uh, a course at ASU uh, called Media Literacies and Composition. And one assignment I, I have with the students do each year is to write a poem or a short story using only phrases they get from autocomplete. 
and I'll, I'll usually give them a, like a seed that they can start with, like, you know, how do I, or something like that. And they can add on letters or words if they want to to kind of farm out, you know, to get more stuff. Uh, but it's, it's fascinating. And one of the reasons that it's, it's so compelling is that you know, I mean, I'm, you know, you, I'm sure Google is manipulating this and, and you know, trying to get you. Uh, but, but they're also, th this is, this is an, a cognitive amplification of what thousands of people must have typed into their search bars at some point or another to actually ask about. And so that can be fascinating, horrifying, uh, deeply sad, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes joyous. When you see what those things are, if you type in how do I, you know, it's sort of mind-blowing. Uh, what comes up, and so the, the 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 poetry, the fiction that comes out the other end is often really interesting because of that too. Uh, to, you know that idea of grooves. You know these are really well-worn grooves. People sitting there typing this stuff in. Um, but what is really intriguing to me now, beyond simply autocomplete, is the whole suite, the the whole apparatus of interaction. And I think Google is the uh, the elephant or maybe the, the octopus in the room in this, in this context because they are now, it is, it, is, it is so easy to look something up on Google and now Google has of course in sort of ingested Wikipedia so Wikipedia entries will pop up if you've ever, if you, you probably noticed that if you're looking for something and Wikipedia happens to have an entry of it, Google puts it right up near the top for you. Uh, often you don't even need to click through to Wikipedia which I'm sure makes Wikipedia sad. Uh, <laughs> And you know they've they've sort of absorbed this entire this entire knowledge infrastructure from uh, Wikipedia, and they have this this project called Knowledge Graph, where they're they're basically going out and trying to uh, ingest vast portions of the web. They started with things like Wikipedia that had structured data, and now they're proceeding out into unstructured data and the, the the deeper wilds of the internet. I feel like eventually they're going to travel back in time and you know start surveying GeoCities with little spiders and. And getting all the all the all the old gifts, um, but uh, what they are what they're really doing is is building this this map of ideas, of, and stuff you know uh, of of cognitive elements and what it, because it's so easy and it's an almost impossible not to begin any intellectual question you have that that you're going to use a computer for it's almost impossible not to begin with Google now in some way shape or form right at least again in English. Uh, certainly in, in the US. Uh, it's easy to forget all the stuff that Google doesn't know. Uh, so that's one, one thing to think about. Uh, and the, the seduction, right, the seduction of perfect knowledge and the seduction of Wikipedia too, which is its own romantic notion of building the universal encyclopedia. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is, is getting, you know, getting back to Sure, there are thousands of people typing this in, but ultimately comes back to you. And is this something that you end up typing in? Why is Google? Why does Google keep trying to complete my sentences and my thoughts for me, right? Uh, and this is some Google now. Google now. Google will tell you when to go to your next appointment. Uh, I find it. I find it deeply useful. I'm not trying to, you know, knock this. I think it's it's exciting and something that you know we need to think hard about at the same time. Uh, but they're not just mapping outer space, the universe of knowledge, they're also mapping inner space, right? They're mapping each of us. And there's this sort of interesting question of what point, at what point do computers and algorithms actually know us better than we know ourselves? Because they can see things about us that we can't easily see. They, can, they, they know way better than us how long it takes us, how, how, exactly how long it takes us to get out of the house each morning, or you know, uh, you know, how long it takes us to eat lunch, or how many typos we make every hour, uh, how, e how efficient we are at 11 a.m. versus 3 p.m. You know, there are algorithms that kind of gather all this information. So uh, what, you know, do you, do you, think, do you think we're going to be more surprised by algorithms that map the outer space of knowledge or the inner space of knowledge? Well, um, I guess, you know, I think that the, um, uh, I think the, the, the risk is that, you know, we will not be aware of it mapping the inner space of knowledge. We um, uh, will not be conscious of the way that it is uh, you know, shaping our cognition, uh, you know, modifying our habits. Uh, you know, the, you know, uh, the utility of Google for you know, searching, you know, for getting the information, that is something that we are aware of. Uh, you know, we're thinking, this is great. 
but uh, um, it is having an effect on us internally, and um, you know that is much much less obvious. Um, and I mean, I think this is this is something that, uh, in a way, is you know it's a continuation of a uh, a long trend of sort of cognitive technologies. Socrates famously he criticized writing because uh, he thought that you know it it only creates the uh, the illusion of wisdom instead of you know someone actually knowing something themselves they just read it somewhere and you know they don't really know it. Um, well, to be fair, Plato really put those words in his mouth when he wrote the book. Right? Yes, so. he did. He did. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you know our our, uh, our reliance on Google and you know the internet in general, in a sense, you know we are like all of us are you know are trivia champs now. <laughs> Um, but uh, you know, we're sort of meta trivia champs, right? We know how to find it. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, uh, uh, we all share uh, we all share a certain uh, uh, cognitive resource now, um, and uh, it is uh, uh, it, yeah. It, it, in a lot of ways, we all feel we we all feel that uh, like. This is an inc incredibly powerful tool, uh, but you know, Socrates or Plato, you know, had a point about uh, the fact that um, there it, it is taking something away from us. You know, when people are deprived of the internet, when you don't have your smartphone, you know, a lot of people they feel less themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, that is. Uh, that is one of the sort of unanticipated you know, side effects of this, this 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 technology that we all love. Yeah, I'm, I I think that that notion of the the, the phone and in some ways also the, the, these invisible things, you know, whether whether it's your Twitter feed or, or or whatever, but there are these these cognitive prostheses that do somehow amplify you that are that are yourself, uh, and which leads to the interesting question of of cognitive proprioception, cultural proprioception, in the sense that you might have these uh, these things that, that have become internalized as part of your identity that only exist virtually uh, and that connect you to other people virtually. You know, I think it, it does fundamentally change uh, who we are as humans. And, you know, as a, as a card-carrying uh, English professor, uh, you know, he, the humanities is changing, right? The, how we read and write is fundamentally changing because of these tools. And that means that how we construct ourselves as human beings and what we think that means is also changing. Uh, and I think we're just at the beginning of that. Um, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, I guess uh, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have, I don't have a, 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 good, Maybe, a, good, a, good, a good line. We, should we Google it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody, somebody out here in the audience will have figured it out for us on Twitter. Um, so yeah, I think uh, who and what will get to think the future, uh, it's clearly going to be a collaboration, right? I think that's the, I think that's the stopping point, yeah. um, as this was. So thank you. Thank All you. All right. So.